Hey everybody, welcome to the Sobriety Diaries. I'm your host, Nate Kelly, a recovering alcoholic seven years from my last drink, a recovery mentor and podcast producer. I am so grateful to be bringing you these powerful stories of recovery told by you, those who live them. Please share this podcast with anyone who may need it today. And with that, let's open the diary on episode 87. Wow, today is so special. We have one of the leading addiction and recovery experts in the US with over 30 years of clinical and business expertise. He is recognized nationally for his technological innovation and for bringing empathy and personal perspective to his practices with addiction having touched nearly every aspect of his own life. He is a practicing psychotherapist, a pioneer in the advancement of recovery recovery technology, and really an unstoppable entrepreneur, which we're going to talk about today. Please welcome Dr. Harold Jonas. Doctor, thank you so much for making time today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about my passion. Our passions, I should say, plural. Thank you so much. So, you know, we got to know each other a little before I pressed record and we're in very different climates. You're very appropriately dressed as well. You're giving that Floridian picture for the audience. So I appreciate that. Doctor, you know, on the Sobriety Diaries, I always like to start with a a personal story and relate it to how we have ended up with this prolific career that has sort of, you know, guided us to where we are today. So, you know, in your bio, I said that addiction and recovery has touched many aspects of your life. So if we could start with the personal side of things and walk us through how you have been touched and from your perspective with addiction and what led you to addiction and recovery. Well, I'm trying to formulate the answer, and I don't know what your time constraints are, so I'll just give you the Reader's Digest version. So we were introduced to alcohol on New Year's Eve as children, and I'm talking yeah. under 10 years old. So okay. this, this was the way it was in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s, that here you are, let's celebrate with your, your adult yeah. parents with a highball, right? That's what they were still called. It was a highball. My father who has drank himself into an early grave and out of his marriage, et cetera, would give us a highball. And and I could not get alcohol past my nose. It was just the most disgusting smell. <laughs> yeah. So my sister, who is older than me, like two and a half years, she drank hers and mine. And that's how that went. And so when marijuana got introduced into the system around 12, 13, and now we're talking, however, what is it, 69, 68? I ran hard with marijuana because now I was a part of the family. Kind of like one of those mafia stories. You're not a part of the family till you commit a crime. <laughs> Some initiation. So we got cigarette smoking, we got alcohol, and now marijuana, which was basically tolerated because they knew they couldn't control me or, or us. And none of us could be controlled at that point. Even culturally, it started to get accepted where the school systems were letting us come to school stoned not giving us consequences. They really had no clue how severe it was. So that's the way it was evolving. And then the curiosity of other drugs and more intense highs ran through the gamut of all the different drugs all the way through high school. And then I majored in more drugs in college and got through a program with some severe consequences directly related to drugs, but it was never really drug related in my mind, which included amputating one of my fingers. Just crazy shit. DUIs, all that crazy. That's a it consequence. Was, was just, yeah, part from the course. So severe. No, it was, it was a, I was still a victim here. And then my addictive brain says, I get married. I won't <laughs> go to jail because I have a wife. And, and if I do that, I'm going to mature. I'm going to mature out of out of this, this horrible mess I'm in. At 24, I meet a woman who agrees to marry me. I'm out on bail. And we get married and, and subsequently stay married and bring children into the world together. And I'm still actively using through all of this. It turns out she's mentally ill. Now, this is my introduction into mental illness or mental health, depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah. Right? That's that's what you learn. So I'm now actively married in, and have a baby, all of 25 years old. And I'm actively using, because that's what you do. You drink, you smoke, you do cocaine when you can afford it. And you be a good provider for your family. I'm in business for the third time already. And I'm determined to make this one work. 
And she decides to get psychotic because she's manic depressive, which is now bipolar. We have a second child and she comes apart. And now the, the pain that I'd already been medicating right up until that point, which I didn't really associate it with pain and dysfunction and trauma and uh, deprivation of love and, and self-esteem, never connected those dots because why would I? I'm in a cloud. I, I, I start moving to longer acting pain medicine, the lauded heroin and, and and all the value system that I had just continued to erode to where now I'm 33 years old. Divorce is pending. I have three children. I'm completely undone uh, living on the street. With, and, and my job now is to support my drug habit. I'm armed with a bachelor's degree in theater. I have a good work ethic and a significant heroin habit and three kids and a crazy wife, right? So I get an opportunity to go to Florida and go to treatment. And this is, you know, 1987. From where to Florida? In Camden, New Jersey. I don't know if you've ever heard of Camden, a small slice in Newark. And I'm on the street on a cardboard box, literally. The girl I'm running around with gets us into a tenement apartment through the Housing Association. And I get this opportunity from my father to come to Florida and go to treatment. I'd already been 12, 13 tries into treatments and detoxes and shit. I'm like, just get me on methadone. Get me on methadone, I'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah, and the methadone counselor, you know, who has such a thing, said, you have an opportunity to get out of here? Let me give you cab fare. I'll send you to the airport right now. You have no business doing this. You're a nice Jewish boy with a middle-class value system that has eroded. So I get on the plane and I never look back. And I left my kids behind. And that's the last time they saw their father get high. They're now 39, 41, and 43. And they have no memory of me getting high. I'm a grandfather. Oh. All super successful. They're all benefiting from the fact that they had a father that actually took a part in their life and got in recovery and stayed clean. Their mother, unfortunately, never really got stable with her meds. She managed. But then she also subsequently died of breast cancer six years ago, prematurely. Part of the reason is, is she didn't really believe she had cancer because of her illness. So really sad. My second wife in recovery, and her and I had another baby, so now I have four. And then my ex-wife had another one, which really made five, which we adopted. So there's a bunch of kids, and I'm urgently needing to make enough money to provide for them. Thus, you need to be creative with business and figure it out. Working by the hours, a therapist is not going to do that. It's not going to do what I need to do for five kids and a wife that like to drive new cars. I'm getting it done. I'm working like my ass off. I go back to grad school. I get my degree and da 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 da, da and all that stuff. And I'm like, I can't get anywhere without credentials. And, and then this marriage in, in recovery started to you know move in different directions where I'm married to her and she's married to being a mom. Uh, it always sort of fascinates me, the relationship side of things. Once people are stable in their recovery and their life starts to change a little bit and people grow apart, did that factor into it? I know what happened in my life relative to our marriage. And I noticed that when people go from casual contact to romance and don't build a healthy foundation for a relationship, it's destined to come apart. Yeah. Think married with children depiction of American family life of getting your high school sweetheart or your first love pregnant, wake up 20 years later and you have mortgages and car payments and children and demands, and you've never really taken time for yourself, which was my biggest fear because the timing of meeting the love of my life, I was new in it. I separated, but then I went back because of my unhealthy need to be loved. And it was really early in recovery. This is not, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I need to do this. <laughs> right. And so we negotiated a baby in graduate school simultaneously. And that was when it went in its separate directions of priorities. And the other kids were there. And so, you know, it was a really interesting negotiation and challenge for us to make it work, which we did. We had a lot of compatible values, but we didn't really know ourselves enough and mature love never really happened. Now we're both in recovery and we have a new child and now there's five of them. He's the youngest of five. And he's the prince of the family, two parents in recovery. The other ones had a disjointed system. He never decided to grow up because he never really had to. And she never really let him. And I'm screaming and kicking all the way through in and out of institutions from age 13 on and in and out of an active addiction. And then one poor decision led to his passing five years ago. 
So we lost him to the 27 club. He's 27 years old. And even though the two of us weren't together as a married couple, we were still legally married. And even with that crisis, we didn't join together to help one another grieve because we can't do that. That's not how it works for anybody. Having seen that with a family that I work with, whose son took his own life and neither of the parents grieved because they were busy taking care of each other. So having experienced that, I said, no, we can't do that. Not because I don't want to, and I don't love you and I don't care about you, but because it's not beneficial for us. We have to move on. She never could move on. She got caught in a spiral of major depression and we lost her in active recovery, right? 35 years clean last year. So my new recovery family, right, that God bestowed on me, and they're both gone. And the message around that is that we can get through anything without coming apart ourselves and using and jumping in the box because grieving is for the living, not for the people who are dead. Wow. Yeah. I have a stepsister, right? I lost her to her drinking at 57 years old. She never got it. You know, I'm on the phone, help me, help me, help me. And okay, I'm on the phone with you. I'm helping you and you're still drinking, you know? <laughs> and now she drank herself to death and her mother who I was on the phone with enabled her and loved her to death because that's what moms do, right? Mom and dads. They will love their children to death. To death, right. And that's because we that's the way they know how to love. That other style of love that may be beneficial for that other human being, they can't wrap their heart and head around at the same time. And then people run hard with it because they don't have to take care of themselves. They have always a safety net and a cushion and no bottom, so to speak, when they look in the mirror. Yeah. Where you and I look one day and said, who wow. is that? Yeah. Because all the other stuff we already know about, of housing and money and credit and jails, and we already know about that stuff. But that one split second, it says, who is that? And then it changes, right? Yes. And however many people I've talked to, that's basically what I've always gotten from them, is that one split second, and it doesn't take long, and, and then they're motivated to do something because they're living dead. They're like that freaking zombie show. Yeah. Walking dead. And you have to capitalize on that split second exactly when it happens. That is the truth. Wow, that's... Right. And when you say capitalize, that means accepting the help that you've begged for over and over again. Because you've been given that help, but have never really truly accepted it unconditionally. That's the clincher because people say, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Kind of, sort of, maybe half ass on my terms with a little secret. But unconditionally, if they told me, take this fork and eat a bowl of dog shit in the parking lot <laughs> and you won't die and not be like this anymore. That's how mm -hmm. it was. Now, 1987, and I've been gifted that generous moment of clarity and presence. Earlier today, somebody wrote in. They had a, a live feed going on. Somebody yeah. wrote a question is, what motivates you every day? And it was like a no-brainer. It was like to do my best, to be my best. And I especially owe my children for that brief period of time that I wasn't, right? I'm still compensating for that. Mm -hmm. Come to a place where I don't have to anymore. They're independent and so forth. But emotionally, I'm still there to do that with them. Was there a moment or a period of time that you had to sort of reunite with your children or was it in treatment and right back with the family? I went back for a visit a near about 10 months later with supervision of a friend of mine who had five years clean. And then I went back around 12 or 13 months because I had a lot of court shit hanging over me. Yeah. And I got to see them and visit with them and the chaos they were living in with their mom. And I had to leave them there. And that was the biggest challenge and struggle. And then in 1989, you got a traditional wedding. My wife sent the three kids down for the wedding. So they came and that was a big reunification for two weeks in 1989. And then subsequently, every summer, they came to visit. And then one day, I got a phone call, oldest son, and we took custody of him at eight years old, my second wife and I, and he came to live with us. And then he got a new brother six months later. So he has his damage as far as that situation. Then my daughter, who's the oldest of the group, she came to live with us at 12. So we had custody of the two older ones. The two younger ones stayed with her in the Philadelphia area. Everybody would go back and forth. And I mediated all this stuff between the two women and the two moms, because that's how the kids perceived they had two moms and they had two families and or one big blended family where their mom would come and stay with us and all the kids and everybody would be together and go on vacation and go to graduations and family events. There was no separation. 
All the kids were one big group, regardless of who the parents were. Biologically, everybody was loving and caring and um, no, no tension in that regard. Money was a big issue because there was a whole bunch of us, and it all seemed to fall here <laughs> because there was a lot of child care that was needed and so forth. And everybody contributed, and we managed. And I didn't work myself into an early grave. The industry was going to chew me up and spit me out, so I got out of it as far as the centers. Yeah. Or becoming a center owner, they walk over your dead body because you on that bed is more important. And that compromising piece that I recognized, I got into supportive housing. I was doing halfway housing and recovery housing. That was more negotiable because you can provide a service and generate revenue simultaneously until I realized that I was a slumlord. They couldn't save enough money to get out. Yeah, we were providing a short-term solution, but the long-term problem is they can't make enough money to save to get out of the halfway house. <laughs> right, right. So I started to chip away getting rid of that. I mean, I've got a pretty strong moral compass. Again, it was supporting the family, so you get caught. So I wound up in technology and wound up in an advertising model because that made more sense than toilets and bushes and chasing crack addicts. Because at that time, crack was the big drug. Chasing crack addicts around town for rent, that's what it was. They would get caught every goddamn week with that big decision, do I get high or do I pay my rent? And then it was an ongoing battle and it was draining. But that crack shit, man, that was brutal to live through and to be in that mode then. I had a motel for a while. But all the time with the technology, I've been doing the technology 20-some years. So was it like around the Y2K explosion of the internet and everything where it transitioned to the sober.com and and recovery coaches on the technology side of stuff? Yeah, yeah, in 2000, we put up the first directory. Yeah. Mom were predominantly the shoppers for treatment centers. Moms are usually wives, girlfriends, or the sociopathic men they're in love with. They're the ones doing the shopping. So we're selling advertising to the industry to appeal to that shopper for the best clinical and financial fit. So we we did that pre-Google. That's how long back. And then Google changed that whole model. And I had already moved into coaching at that point in 2004, 2005. And again, I was a little bit too far ahead of the curve. That was going to be the next piece that people needed because that people could afford coaches. Yeah. They could benefit from coaches more than therapy because therapy is a bunch of talking and people leave the office and forget half of it and don't do their work mm. and then just moan about their shitty therapist and, you know, blah, blah, blah. People embracing coaching. So we started to train coaches in curriculum and curriculum writing. We did that and then we put it online. And then from there, I was like, oh, let's put an app together so they can do the app on the phone and coaching themselves yeah. on the app. And so we did that evolution of the advertising, the coaching, then the app, which did not turn the industry upside down, which I had hoped, because it would reduce relapse and increase accountability, and people could take responsibility for themselves and be held accountable by their loved ones and their people in their lives. And uh, yeah, we love that, but if they get better, they won't get high, they won't come back to treatment, and then we won't have a business. Come so on. Wrong, right. The right. And then at the end, right, 2018, I said, I got it. I'll pay people to do this. I will pay people. So I create my own cryptocurrency. We call it SoberCoin. And I'm going to pay people and I'm going to reward them for not killing themselves with cryptocurrency. And guess what you can buy with it? You can buy coaching. You can buy coach training. Yeah. That's all you can buy with it. You can only buy shit to get better. And people are like, we don't want to do that because (laughs) if we get better, then we can't get high anymore. So that's still kind of floating around like a lost boys thing. And I still believe in it. Still believe in that reward pathway with immediate gratification. And we're going to give you something of value if you don't kill yourself and change your behavior. And and that's really the only way it works because not dying ain't good enough. Money will get people to change. Being loved isn't good enough. But again, giving them something, they don't value it. So I'm still stuck on earn your way to a better life. And you can have whatever you want. That's what I believe in. Because you did it, right? I'm doing it. There's scores of people that are listening, that are doing it. So we know it works. What does it take? What is it going to take, right? How do we get that moment in the mirror to stick? Mm. Because they've all had it. They've all had it. And they dismiss it. Or they close their eyes and blink and go get high again or whatever they do. Well, it seems like you've been really ahead of the curve on some of these huge developments. What's next? Tell us what you're ahead of this time. Let us in on what the next big thing is. Well, the ketamine and hallucinogens are going to take the industry out. I think that's what's going to happen. When the FDA gives more permissions for ketamine, which is now nationwide, 
and mushrooms and people recognize that they can do an episode or journey into their psyche, not recreationally, and leave that episode with a double of insight and that moment of clarity and get better. And we know that that works. And everybody I've talked to about it agrees with me. But again, if you do it, you're a heretic and it's not beneficial and so forth because it's still done on out of the country. Yeah. And that's part of the dilemma. I've referred people to treatment out of the country for these episodes and they've come back drug free and calm and tranquil and they're not using. And these are people with multiple treatment episodes in multiple traditional treatment mm -hmm. settings that have gotten nothing out of it but misery because they didn't get what they needed, which was this connection of their unconscious and consciousness motive of why they keep self-destructing and what they want for themselves. So are the ketamine treatments or the microdosing, is this something that is long-term or to sort of get us over the hump? Or is this like a maintenance program that would go on or is it situational? Well, everybody's going to be different. Yeah. Some people one episode and they're done. They're not using again. Yeah. And then they may go back and do a maintenance episode or journey as it was referred to. Yeah. Um, and other not. And again, not recreational. This is a medicinal piece that's guided and uh, somebody's there with you. You're not sitting at home getting high. So there's an intent to every dose, so to speak. Yeah. So, um, I, I just sent a guy off to Ecuador yesterday and he's planning on doing two ayahuasca journeys. Drug of choice is alcohol. He's made it to 40 somehow with two broken back episodes and, of course, medicating the chronic pain and misery and depression and isolation and all the things that go with it. This is his next move to kind of get on the other side of this and stay on the other side and disconnect from his unhealthy, toxic relationship with alcohol because it's like a divorce. It I mean, really is. He's going to come back completely divorced and grieving, but in a different way than we talk about grieving the lifestyle of using because he doesn't have any of that. Not everybody is, but he's a good candidate to come back because he's done a lot of homework, a lot of research. So he's already motivated for that change, which helps. It's like when you quit cigarettes, it's the same thing. If you're motivated for change, then you're ready to go and you can implement your plan and stay with it. So in answer to your question, everybody's going to be different, but I think this particular intervention is going to get creeping in more and more, and people are going to choose this once the insurance companies start to buy into it what they've been paying for all these decades and getting miserable, miserable results. I mean, I can't even say there's any results because they're like in single digits, depending on who's counting and what they define as success. You need five years of measurement to see if somebody's actually changing the quality of their life. Has this person's quality of life increased? And some of them are smoking pot, but not drinking. Some are doing cocaine on the weekends, but they're not smoking pot. Does that count as improvement? Yes, they're not beating their kids. They're going to work. They're paying their bills. This is amazing. This is fantastic. The models that we're paying for now is that if you use your failure and you need to go back, and that is not working. It hasn't been effective for the majority of people that are experiencing it. It's just until it's replaced and eased into a new modality, that's what we're with. Five years before it becomes a norm. This is one of your treatment options for Cigna, is that you can find a provider will pay for mm. academy. What would you look for as, you know, someone that is a good candidate for these treatments or one of these journeys? Right now, I'm finding people that have what they would identify as multiple failures in traditional treatment episodes. Traditional treatment centers, halfway houses, and to run that gamut sometimes five times, sometimes ten times. And they're disgusted with the model. They are looking for something else. They're looking for an alternative. Right now, those are the best candidates. Somebody's completely ignorant and doesn't know any different. And this is what we're going to do right from the jump street. So they have no clue about AA and NA. They have no clue about going to drug treatment. They can stop using for a period of time, which is usually a good idea before they do one of these things and maintain that even if they have to white knuckle it, so to speak. But they can come in, their receptors are clean, put the medicine in there and get the results we're looking for. They're motivated. And most people, of course, can't do that. They can't stay drug-free for two weeks prior to starting. This is where the risk becomes kind of shaky with some people. This guy that's gone to Ecuador, he missed that fine print where we want you to not use. <laughs> so we'll see. He's still smoking cigarettes, still smoking marijuana, and drinking occasionally significantly less where he's a blackout drinker and getting in trouble. 
he's not doing that. Yeah, there's some homework on our side, right? <laughs> I think he's going to do great. He's ready. 39, he's ready to be on the other side. I wish him the best. Doctor, I like to leave the listeners with a few takeaways or some tangible things they can take away from the episode. If someone is looking for that moment to sort of jumpstart things, perhaps in a more traditional way through your own experience, some things that they can take off their headphones and do today. If a person is willing to help, find some a reservoir of humility to accept that help because we ask for help in desperation and are contemptuous that that person can help us. And we aren't always able to accept it fully and follow direction. Mm -hmm. I think if I could bestow anything on anybody that's seeking a new way of life, the change is possible. Hope only ends when we die. We don't need to be walking dead. We can be our best. It's really believing what you already believe and that drugs are there as a power greater than ourselves. And they always have been and they always will be because they change the way we think and feel and they're designed to do so. So it's okay to put our faith there for a reason as an asset instead of a liability. It's like carrying us to a place of redemption, even though we're completely doing things that are not in our best interest. We can use that as that channel and pathway. My drug dealer used to tell me to get help, right? She said, <laughs> You can do this differently. But she knew I had children in my car when I went to see her. And she's also all whacked out. So that's the kind of messaging that we discount, but is there and been present. So it's like looking for that message and the handwriting on the wall and it's flashing red. It's okay to pay attention. That's what I would like to leave people with. I could tell them to read a ton of books. They want to be able to pick up the phone and get better. Well, since you said it, I'm looking to add something to my nightstand. So are there any things off the top of your head? I want to share with you, of course, Slaying the Dragon. Great read. It's a great history book. I'm listening to a lot of podcasts. I'm reading Carlos Castaneda right now. The rituals that went with the introduction of mescaline back in the 60s. And because it's been with us, this stuff is not new. It's been with us in ancient civilizations for years. This is not new stuff to elevate people to a higher level of consciousness. That's what I'm looking at imparting on others is finding our best pathway forward. And again, the urgency for me as I'm on the other side of my lifespan is maybe higher than people in their 40s, but they could have a higher quality of life if they found it sooner, right? And again, the reason I couldn't venture here because I've been studying Ibogaine since 90, 91. I came across Ibogaine and the FDA's research and they said, this stuff works. This is amazing. We can't have this in the community. Ibogaine is a root, like ayahuasca is a root in Peru and South America. Ibogaine is a root out of Africa. Oh. And it works on the opiate receptors connection with your inner self through these journeys. And it creates similar side effects. But you can get to that proverbial third eye and yeah. see what it is and your maximum potential and who you're meant to be. Uh, it's called Ibogaine. It's the name of the drug. Iboa is the name of the actual root, so to speak. They do it in Mexico. And it's a one-time flat fee. It's not like this ongoing nonsense. And you come out and you're done. You don't even want to use. And it's like, how does that happen? How does that happen that you leave a facility after 10 days and you don't want to kill yourself anymore? How does that happen? And it's a phenomenon like many that are is inexplainable. Yes. It's in multiple pathways of recovery. That's what open your eyes. There's many to choose from. Just do some homework, make some calls. I'm easy to find. There's so much great information and so many resources on your website. I will definitely link the website in today's show notes, the books that we talked about. What's the best way if listeners want to reach out and connect with you? My email, I'm very responsive, is jonas at sobernetwork.com. That's our main site, sobernetwork.com. It lists all of the stuff that we do. We have a bunch of satellite sites. We're generating revenue through emails and, and uh, not through emails, through advertising and crap like that. But the intent is really to bring attention to the illness and to pathways of recovery. If you want to be a guest on our podcast, anybody's welcome to put in a, a voice to their recovery. And we accept everybody. We line them up. We do a show every week. We just give people a forum to talk about them because they know them better than we know them. So we want them to share their experience, strength, and hope with the world. So we give everybody a form. If they want, just fill out the form on the soberpodcast.com and Carrie, our producer, will find you and, and line you up. Sober.com is going under a transformation. 
We have the coaching site, recoverycoaches.com. You want to be a coach, get a coach, go there. So there's plenty of resources to access and we make it available for anybody who wants to do their part. We'll figure it out. Thanks so much for listening today, friend. Hopefully you heard something that resonates with you. And if we help just one person, our job is done. Make sure you check today's show notes for all the information discussed in today's episode and how to connect with our guests. Until next Wednesday, try your best not to drink and be good to yourself. Bye, everyone.